Cookies, and we are here live for the Bud Show. We are on season two, episode 40 something, I think. <laughs> One of these days, I promise I will figure that episode thing out. Um, but we are really, really excited about our evening because we have two phenomenal guests from our Canada community. Um, you may or may not know them, but we're gonna let them introduce themselves. I like to let y'all do that as opposed to trying to mess up names. I mean, I got your name down, which by the way, most people mess up. And I got your name <laughs> down, so I feel pretty confident. And your name is pretty easy, but we'll just let you do it anyways. So if you all could look at the wonderful camera, tell our audience where to find you um, on social media, not your home addresses, and who you are, and then we'll just go from there. Uh, we'll do ladies first, Michael. Of course. We'll switch though because I'm all about equal rights for all. <laughs> so throughout the show, we'll make sure that you um, get to go first sometimes as well. <laughs> so who are you? My name is Sarara Corva, oh. and I'm the CEO of Undo, and we manufacture the only patented nutritional supplement that helps clear your head from too much THC. I love it. And how long have you been in the cannabis industry to be here this evening with us as we talk about the history of cannabis? As an industry, 2011, when the bill was passed in Arizona. Awesome. Yeah. All righty. I'm going to turn the mic over to you, even though there's no physical. Sure. It's yeah. already on the table yeah. for you. So. My name is Michael Sylvia, and I'm the CEO of a company called HerbSwift.com. I'm also a managing partner at a company called Natural Hemp Solutions. I've nice. uh, been in the industry since about March of 2012. Very cool. Um, it started in the marijuana side and has gravitated over the last five or six years more onto the uh, hemp side. But either way, we're going to get these uh, important therapeutically beneficial plant molecules to the people. Yes. And I mean, I think even that you opened up conversation right there as you talk about marijuana and hemp, because I think a lot of um, people don't necessarily understand or know the difference or any of that. So hopefully today during our topic of conversation, um, we can break some of those things down for people that are listening because I know as a patient myself who's been medicating for over 20 years, um, really learning about the different plants and the different compounds and all of the different components of this beautiful, actually two beautiful plants, right, um, has just been a lot. And so, yeah, I'm excited about what y'all are gonna share with us tonight. All right, so um, I know you have kind of like a little, you're, you do educational, right? You both do education. Um, so do you want to kind of get us started? And then we'll kind of go back and forth and talk about some things that we know about the plant and the history of cannabis. Because um, that's really our goal tonight is just to dive into where did it all start. I think that's kind of important, right? We're using this beautiful plant, but... Where did it begin? Do you want to go first? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, um, according to archaeological records, the man's um, cultivation, it's his relationship with the plant goes back to at least about 8,000 BCE. Um, and this is in ancient Asia, basically the ancient Orient. And back then it was started just as a, a very durable fiber. It was grown for fibers and industrial reasons. And textiles and things in, of that nature. Eventually they started to consume the seeds and then other parts of the plant where they became aware of some of the uh, other medicinal properties of the plant, things like that. So the history goes on and on and on from there. Um, there's more history of it in ancient India. Um, in fact, that's where we get the word um, anandamide, which is the endogenous uh, cannabinoid that's produced naturally in our body that's very similar molecularly. Wait, say that word again, please. Anandamide. Anandamide? Anandamide. And ananda is the Sanskrit word for bliss. Oh. So it's literally named after bliss. It's the bliss molecule. Bliss molecule. Oh. And, and everybody has experienced, <laughs> everybody has experienced anandamide kicking it in their body before. We get it um, and we refer to it as runner's high. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Or a second wind. Yes. And that's anandamide being naturally produced as a result of stress, typically physical. And that's your body producing an andenite. It's almost molecularly identical to THC. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you get that high feeling. We call it runner's high. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. All right, let's rewind a little bit. So if we go back to this uh, continent, can I speak? 
Mm-hmm. We go back to the continent of Asia. It was Central Asia, right, for the most part, from what I read about of where it really started. Am I right? I think so, yeah. Okay. And then, do you have anything to add to the stuff that he said? Well, because I read, I read about some seeds that were found in some graves uh, at about 500 BC. BC yeah, I right? believe I had read um, that viable cannabis seeds were found in an Egyptian tomb with a mummy at some point, okay. and I felt like that news came out like three years ago or so, huh. roughly. But um, maybe a little longer. I, things blur together in this industry. Everybody well, does. according to my notes, it's the <laughs> mum, mummy of Ramses II. There you go. Who died in 1213 BC. There you go. And they found um, cannabis pollen on the mummy. Wow. Yeah. Okay, that's so, pretty cool. And not only in Egypt, but in ancient Greece, Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, who the namesake of the Hippocratic Oath, he used to carry cannabis in his medical bag in Greece. It was... So every, they knew even early. back then that yeah. this like plant was just beautiful and amazing and blissful. I, just, yes. I really like it. Yeah, there are now. papyrus records that suggest the Egyptians used it for, um, uh, they used it for lisp, actually. They used it for uh, pain. They used it for menstruation or menstrual cramps or whatever. Mm-hmm. They Typhus used it for, and glaucoma yeah, yeah. and every, everything they that used we it have for, qualifying conditions. Exactly. A, a lot of things to do with sight and vision. Uh, different things like that. I Brain can... spasms. Why is spasms. none of this taught in schools? Do you think? Can I ask you? Like, it's not taught in any school. So I mean, it's not taught in middle school. It's not taught in high school. It's not taught in college. Like, I mean, really, to find any of this, you, you have know what to the dig. most the most important question of why why is it not taught here is why is it not taught yet in medical schools? Right. It's yeah. just starting to get into curriculum now in, right. in medical in schools. In about 14% of the medical schools. Correct. It's right. just now starting to get there, and there are there is more and more interest from that you know part of society, which is super important and really is what's got us here as well. But I think when it comes down to that, there's when you know the history of it, it's there's no better word. It's yeah. a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy yeah. to keep people ignorant so that they can just keep making money off of them hand over fist yeah. With synthetic drugs that right. just mask symptoms uh, and, uh, the and cascade. Keep us sick oh and ignorant. God. Yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not. We don't have health care. Like... We have. We have sick care. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just maintaining, yeah. managing symptoms and creating new ones and then managing those and. It's... Literally, every drug you take causes problems where and you need another drug. And most of us don't care more. because insurance yeah. is covering ninety percent of the cost. Who's insurance? Of... What well, insurance? Well, a prescription are you drugs. About? Yeah, right. But uh, that's if you're. But that's only like. Let's be honest on that one. That's only if you're actually um, have the luxury of having insurance. Sure. There's a huge sure. population right. doesn't sure. have. Sure. But any for those insurance. who for those who have insurance, yes. that's that category yeah. is covered the most. Yeah. Right. Has the highest percentage, lowest. And it well, every every, every cancer yeah. every cancer patient is worth an average of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to the medical community. And none of that Everyone. is even in and cannabis, that, right? Because right. We, that's not even talking that's about pharmaceuticals. Cannabis. Wow. This is why it's not taught. Correct. Right. Because Rockefeller. They have an industry built around the profits of keeping people ill. Yeah. And cannabis has many ways of helping people to not be ill. <laughs> in every way. <laughs> so this prohibition that we're experiencing now, it hasn't always been like this. So we, you know, we start in Central Asia, we move to India, we move to Egypt, we move to these other continents where we see yeah. that it's 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 there, it's used, right? Whether it's medicinal or for um, productivity, I'm going to say, sure. meaning, you know, sure. well, using the rope or whatever. Um, but at what point did it come to America? When well, there's happen? also the sativa family of plants that came from the equ- equator region, the equ- equatorial region. So that's different from the ones that yes. are... Yes. So cannabis came from two very distinct different areas. Okay. So yeah. is it the indica base that came from Asia? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So Kush, indica Afghani, from Asia. Afghani and Kush. And then sativa is from the Ecuador region? Mm-hmm. region? Yeah. I, I am just learning. Look, I've just been medicating with this stuff my whole life, okay? I'm not going to lie, so this is why sure. I feel that there's a need to help educate other people because I don't know either. So, you know, and again, I think starting these conversations and making safe spaces for people to ask these questions and kind of have the silly conversations of like, well, we didn't know. And yeah. How, yeah. how well, that's it seems why so hybrids, easy, but we didn't know. 
So this is why hybrids are so much fun is because they're taking genetics from two entirely different regions of the world and bringing chemistry and cannabinoids and terpenes together that never were before huh. and creating many, many, so many more medicines. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah it's, it's very interesting and um, the, the history is long and it's ubiquitous. I mean, all over recorded history and different civilizations, we see written evidence, if not archaeological evidence. Um, there are uh, hieroglyphs in the mm-hmm. in in various of places. Plant? Yes, yes. Of, really. Of, yes, yes. In, shut the front door. Yes, absolutely. Really? They, oh my god. You yep. know there there's uh, descriptions in ancient Israel or you know Middle East, ancient Middle East. Cannabosum, exactly. Yep. That's exactly where I was going yep. in the Bible. Yep. The anointing oil, okay. the holy anointing oil. Lists. Wait, Jesus used cannabis. Most likely, yes. Yes. There is. Yes. There's a list of ingredients oh, yeah. of the holy anointing oil in. I forgot. I think I can't remember which which chapter of the uh, which book of we'll the Bible. Forgive you. But, it's okay. But uh, it lists, you know, myrrh and a couple of other things, and on there is a an ingredient called cannabosum, right. which sounds an awful lot like cannabis. Right. You mm-hmm. know, and and if you study so etymology at all, etymology is a, essentially the study of the origin of words. You know, in. Yeah. If you study that at all, you start to see cannabis everywhere. Like canvas is literally a derivative of the name cannabis because almost all sales that were made up until we prohibited it in 1937 were made from cannabis. And okay, wait, so wait, rewind, rewind, rewind. Right. Sales as an S A I L. S A I L S. Yes, I, uh, that's yes. right. I, I knew. Uh, well, I mean, it took my brain like half a Ship second. Sales. To, yes, yeah, I figured sales. that out. Okay, right. but let's rewind. And, so, how did it get to America, right? Because it wasn't, we don't know that it was, was it used by the native oh, uh, people, we, indigenous we, people to. We're pretty sure the, the Spanish conquistadors brought it because there's okay. evidence of it starting to grow in South America in the 1500s. Okay. That's and that the, would make sense because it's not that. Far the, region for right. to come, right? Yeah, it's just a matter of... And you, there's lots of regions in the right. U.S. Sure. where it would grow very and, well. And, uh, you know, those those conquistadors, those pirates, those those uh, merchant uh, sailors, everywhere. they flooded America, you oh. know, once and then they, they when they came there. from Europe, they brought seeds as well, sure. yeah. right, okay. from the get-go. Yep. Okay. And it was considered one of the most important economies because when the sailors would come over on their ships with the hemp, um, sails, ropes, um, and lines, and you know, many, many boat parts. Yes. And they couldn't get home unless they had new, new hemp. sails oh, gotcha. and lines okay. and so new you hemp. Need that. And hemp grows yeah. much That's faster, right. right? So hemp, it grows at a, like, if you're going to oh, yeah, compare it to rapid. other products or other um, uh, weeds. Kind of, Yes, thank you. <laughs> other things that thank you yeah. for helping me around. But yeah, for other things that we could use to make those textiles, like it definitely grows fast. It's super sturdy. Like there's a million and one reasons why they would use Antibacterial it. Antibacterial. So yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't know this one either. Yeah. Yeah. Holy cow. yeah, as a matter of fact, spent hemp, some companies, one of the ones I work with is, is looking to become 100% zero waste, uh, literally use 100% of the plant. So one of the things they're entertaining right now, they've got some interest, is actually providing spent hemp that's been milled. Um, it's fluffy. It's antibacterial as a bedding for natural bedding oh. for the inside of uh, pet beds. What wow. a wonderful idea! Yeah. Another thing they're doing with the spent wow. hemp is they're pelletizing wow. it and they're using it in uh, livestock feed, animal feed, because okay. it still actually well, has trace about... amounts of the cannabinoids. You can never get 100% out, so it still has terpenes and flavonoids right. and think about in how it. that could and help. it's still super rich in fiber think of how that could help pets heal exactly i mean sick pets laying in hemp beds are going to get the benefit of the the cannabinoids and yeah well CBD. even then that's got to be better than the the uh, not to be a jerk, but whatever's currently inside that's of it right. that's probably covered right. in pesticides. And sure. again, I mean, that's right. plastics. Yes, and... yes. And our hemp, unfortunately, is oh probably my God, what a, great a lot of pesticides are probably used as well, depending on where it's sourced. So I think part of people's due diligence in using these products is kind of figuring out where they're sourced and, you know, making mm, sure yes. it's ethically done and all that good stuff. Because I don't think that's always, again, easy, especially as a patient, you go out and, you know, CBD, for example, is everywhere. So sure. GHC, I at least have to get a medical card and go through someone to get and yeah. where CBD literally is now on the grocery store shelves in Circle K yep. and Gas Sprouts. Stations. Yeah, to the point where... 
Yeah. I know. Even Dang, even walking question. even walking into Sprouts, I look at the CBD products. And I'm like, do these people even have any idea? No, any idea well, at all? Well, I swear it would be great, though, too, if there was education. Like, I would love it yeah. if Sprouts, like, it's great that they're going to carry it, but where's the education behind it? So there, there is a, an they? explanation for all of this. Oh. Um, you're probably not going to be super pleased with it, but it's oh, the reality. Oh, you're going to upset it. us today? I don't know. I've probably already, I usually like, do anytime time I open my mouth. So <laughs> <laughs> um, No, but it, this ultimately comes, the lack of education and all this that you're, you know, even the lack of standardized testing, this all comes down to inaction from government, really the right. FDA. This is squarely under their jurisdiction. They've ignored it for a few years. Then the commissioner resigned and went and jumped on the board of Pfizer. Uh, and now they just added a new commissioner of the FDA. They've been ignoring it, basically. Uh, it's the elephant it's in the room. It's a hot potato. Yeah, it's the elephant in the room. And, and they've been ignoring it. And because they've been ignoring it, it's created a weird environment. A, 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 volatile atmosphere. There are big corporations who have been kicking the tire of the CBD industry for a long time already, mm -hmm. for at yep. least four or five years. Mm -hmm. And some of them have started to slip in a little bit here or there under the radar in yep. various ways, but they've done it in a very deliberate way. Um, they're only car carrying topicals typically. There are some exceptions to that depending on where you go, but if you're looking at big box you know, Kroger's or Walmart or some of these other places, uh, Safeway has some different like places like that. Mm -hmm. You're going to only see topicals or personal care like bath bombs. Because it's still federally Ill illegal. It's, it's not, there is no law prohibiting it. It's just a pub policy, a public policy of the mm -hmm. FDA that because there is a drug with this active ingredient approved, uh, FDA approved, you can't add it to the food supply. But the counter argument to that is, that only stands if there's no evidence of it ever been in, been in the food supply previously. And well, there's plenty of evidence. That well, it's been lot, in food. lots of people people are making very sound arguments that the the fact that we have an endocannabinoid system, an endogenous cannabinoid system, is a pretty good indicator that at some point these molecules enter our body via diet, and our body figured out a way to utilize them because they mimic so closely you know, uh, things that we're already making. So, or they may, be even, they may have even stimulated the evolution of that system right. is, is really what I'm trying to say. Fantastic. And the fact is we know just historically that livestock fed on hemp in this country for a long, long time. There was a point in this country's history where it was illegal if you owned a certain size farm, it was illegal for you not to yes, grow hemp. Yes, right. yes, 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 you yes. You were allowed yes. to pay your federal taxes yep. in hemp weight. Same notes. Right? So <laughs> there was a time in this country where it was <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, yeah, and there are down. still parts of this country <laughs> where, where hemp grows in the wild. It grows feral. Yeah. Yep. Um, especially like parts like Nebraska and that area where there's, you know, it's pretty rural in general right. and it's been, it's been farmland for, you know, for eons. Right. So, well, it's also understood that some of our modern day illnesses are caused by cannabinoid deficiency. Yeah, that, so I try to explain this to people because they think that they're just going to take, for example, you know, um, they're in a lot of pain and they're going to do one dropper of CBD and now everything's going to go away. And I right. try to explain them like that's not really how it works. Right. You like need you need to do have a get regimen into your of system it, right? and titrate it to a point where it's beneficial. Yes, that's my so mom that, is on a regimen. I just want to say yeah, turmeric and CBD. My mom's on it. Great. Check. <laughs> Done. It's a, it's a potent combination. Those right? two. Right. Um, there, there is a. Uh, um, relatively famous uh, PhD nutritionalist, um, at least famous to some folks in the cannabis industry. I believe his name is Dr. William Courtney. And he, I'm paraphrasing his quote right now, but basically he says that cannabis isn't a drug. It's a essential phytonutrient right. that co-evolved over millions of years with m mammals and particular humans. Mm -hmm. right. um, and its deficiency in modern populations is very likely the cause of all sorts of chronic right. diseases. Mm -hmm. So and we don't have hemp in our clothing, we're it, not feeling, we don't have hemp in our soaps. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something where- We're not eating it. We probably consumed it directly through right. one of these formats, or we consumed it indirectly through consuming the byproducts of animals like milks and cheese. Yep. Because we know in, in endocannabinoids for sure pass through um, 
mammalian breast milk. So it's likely that phytocannabinoids do as well. Wait, wait. So I just got to touch on that real quick. So what you just said, because you were speaking super scientific, which is great, <laughs> but let's just break that down for those that are watching or listening. So what you're speaking about is that, um, and we're getting a little personal, sorry. So through the breasts, when a mother is feeding her child, she's actually giving the child CBD or endocannabinoids in essence, yes, correct? Yes. She's giving it to them. Yes. Everyone naturally, yes. without yes. ever doing yes. CBD or THC, correct. she's automatically giving her child this, cannabinoids. this cabin, these cannabinoids already. Correct. It's happening. Correct. How do we know that? Do we know that? Can I ask that? Yeah, because okay. we've studied breast we've milk studied extensively breast. for okay. decades. And we, we now that we've been able to identify it in a plant, and then we... So it started in the 60s at 64 63 with, with yeah, Meshulam, Raphael Meshulam. And, you know, he first isolated THC and figured out what the active component was. Then he studied how it affected uh, neurological tissue and he actually identified receptors. Then he looked for other cannabinoids and to see if they had any other effect on other receptors. He eventually was able What's to... What's this guy's name? He sounds pretty Raf, Dr. Raphael Meshulam. Okay. The godfather of cannabis science, okay, basically. That's pretty important, he's, and I think if we're using cannabis, we might all want to know his name. Yeah. Say it one he's more a, time. He's a, <laughs> Dr. Raphael Meshulam. Raphael Meshulam? Meshulam. Okay. M-E-C-H-O-U-L-A-M, I think. Okay, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so we know a lot more about it. He's and, almost 90. Oh, he's yeah. still alive? Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah, and well, he, thank you for your contribution. You know what's even to better? Manifest, doctor. He wasn't. He wasn't certain at the time, um, although he suspected it. But it turns out when he tells his stories, because I've seen him speak a few times, and he still goes around and, and talks about a lot of this. But when he first acquired cannabis to test, he actually probably broke enough laws to go in jail for about three life sentences at the time. Wow! And he didn't know he was. He he was. Somewhat sure he was, but he went to the local police chief and explained who he was and what, you know, he worked for, you know, the university and whatever he's doing this research. And, you know, I really need some cannabis. I don't know where else to get it. Can you take some out of evidence room? And the chief was like, yeah, sure. Here you go. Pile of hash. So he's literally got a pile of hash in his, you know, a pound of hat, two pounds of hash in his, in his satchel bag on a train going back to the university. That he got from the police. Yes. Yes. What so, a so beautiful it, story. It's, thank God the, the chief of police in that area of Israel was open-minded enough right. Right, to, to just say, yeah, I mean, you clearly want to use this for scientific right. purposes. That's right. I thought that would be a really good cover, though. I'm just yeah. saying. like. So there's a movie called The Scientist. Okay. And it's about That's him? That's about Meshulam. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And you said it's he's beautiful. alive and still, still giving speeches? Still alive and kicking, yes. Yeah. Does he still do speeches today? Yeah, I just uh, saw I think him so. three months ago. Yeah. You know him? Yeah. I love, love, hate. <laughs> like, I hate you right now, but I love you so much that I can't even really utter the words hate to you, but I love hate you right now. Well, you... I do I do those medical conferences in Denver. Yes. Right? Yes. So he, yeah. yes. He do you was... personally know him as well? I've met him. I wouldn't okay. say I'm like buddies with him or anything yeah. like that. Okay. I'd like but to I've have him there with him, but... <laughs> I've been to his office. And, yeah. And yeah. No, that's awesome. Well, I've met him, shook his hand, and you know, sat down with him for a few minutes. But yeah, I've... that's a, I mean, that's like one of he's the... very approachable. Yeah, right? no, that's a pioneer in the yeah. industry. So it's yeah. I don't and he wants starstruck. So yeah, he's he's the best. I think he's very proud of what he's seeing. You know. His, because his of work, what's happening yeah, now. Yeah, I mean, his work is really why we're where we're at. For, for sure. sure. It's, he, yeah, I mean, I came from the isolated the molecules. on the back roads of upstate New York as a young girl to being able to buy, you know, go in and pick what medicine is going to work best for me. Mm -hmm. So I would say we've definitely come a, a long way mm -hmm. since then. And even, I mean, if he's been doing it 90 years, that's only like 25 years of the journey. If he's been doing it 90. Yeah, well, started studying, I think it's six, I think 63 or 64. Oh, wow, okay. And uh, so, I mean, wow. I'm, obviously he's retired, just speaks, you yeah. know, he goes to these events. He's not retired, actually. Is he still doing some research? Yes. Good for him. Good he's for got him. a whole research lab yeah, and good for a him. team of... Wow. People that work with him. And, That's you know, awesome. Yeah. That's so amazing. Yeah, I had the great, really great honor of going to see him in his lab and uh, Dr. Reuven Orr, who is responsible for the hematology department at the Jerusalem uh, Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem. And they actually use cannabis in the cancer ward. Yeah, it's beautiful. In the hospital, they use a, the vaporizer. 
Yeah. And I was able to go there and be there. And wow. They have a counter. And people come up and they buy their flour and the no 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 they didn't have anything smokable it's all non-smokable okay. but they did sell rolling papers <laughs> and pipes in the hospital right oh. there oh. it was amazing well, i have great pictures i'll look i'll look for and them other for countries you. are doing it a lot different i mean there's other countries where they have yeah. all this research we're here we're still struggling to do it i mean even... Well, a lot of these, that's why Muffy and I created the uh, conferences in Denver was because we, it was in 2014 was the first one we did. And at that time, there really was no other medical conferences besides patients at a time. Mm -hmm. So we were really the second conference and we brought in Courtney and Mishulam by Skype. We had the best, we had three days worth of the most profound speakers and they had were people that had never really met each other yet at that point yeah yeah and my dream and her dream was that we wanted to bring the people together the minds together to spur something bigger and well that's definitely happened <laughs> and like oh, yeah and right? like all good ideas whose time has come it cannot be stopped that's yeah. right so yeah i'm excited to have gotten in so early and i knew it was a bit of a risk but um I had a personal experience, as I'm sure most people who end up in the industry do, and, and uh, what really kept me in college. Uh, a lot of people think that, you know, drugs can, you know, I don't really think it's a drug, but a lot of people think it's a drug and they think that those drugs can, mm. you know, demotivate. Yeah, lead yes. you down the wrong path. And yes. The, the, I was a student athlete and yes. um, uh, I struggled. Um, I basically developed a fairly moderate case of insomnia. I pretty much could not get my mind. I was exhausted because I was a student athlete. Um, I was physically exhausted, but I just couldn't get my mind to ever slow down. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't finally slow down and stop until, you know, most mornings was somewhere between 4.30, 5.30 in the morning. Yikes. And then I got to be up in about an hour and a half, uh, you know, right. and, um, it, the, and it got worse, you know, because you, now you're cut, you start, you know, like how many days in a row do I got to live, you know, and mm -hmm. it gets worse and worse and worse. It tends to perpetuate. And so I tried a couple of other things because I had a little bit of experience with cannabis to that point, but very little, you know, maybe right. two or three times at a couple of random high school or college parties or something. Um, and I was so messed up on alcohol, I couldn't tell whether or not it was even affecting me. <laughs> That's a but, really good point. Right? Or, or so it didn't I, I didn't really. Good because you were mixing yeah. two initially, yeah. which yeah. is also That's not a good really thing good in the point. beginning. When For sure. So, you know, my, I wasn't, my point is I wasn't particularly impressed or whatever. I was, a, you know, I was a college student athlete, you know, I was going places. I had a certain perspective of, of drugs and, and you were so not going right. to be a stoner. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. You know, whatever Teach their own, but it wasn't me. It wasn't yeah. for me. And, and, uh, you know, so I tried a couple of over, over the counter stuff things and, you know, they put me to sleep, but I barely could stay awake in class the next day. Right. I felt like I weighed 40 pounds heavier on the field the next afternoon. Uh, I was after a day or two, I'm like, this isn't going to work. Right. This is definitely this is not going to work. Not yes, this yeah. is actually worse than not sleeping. Mm. Um, I tried alcohol, tried a few different things, you know, just what the heck can I try, you know. Tried meditating, tried a bunch of stuff, and, uh, you know, it wasn't until I was falling, I fell asleep next to my lab partner in chemistry, and, uh, you know, he nudged me. He's like, what's up with you, man? You, you look exhausted. You know, you look tired. I'm like, I don't really sleep that much anymore. And uh, he suggested it. He, and he was actually one of the smartest kids I ever met to that point. Still, to this day, one of the smartest kids I ever met. My lab partner from chemistry. And he was like, we ever tried weed? I'm like, well, yeah, yeah I've had it a few times before. He's like, but have you ever just had weed and then going to sleep? I'm like, no. He's like, try it out. So you know, it wasn't hard to find. I grabbed some later that day and packed a little bowl and, and hit it. And uh, I slept great. I mean, you know. Thankfully, it had the right cannabinoids. Yeah. Because I mean, <laughs> it could I think, have been stimulating. Uh, yeah. Right. I think, uh, well, you know, this is back in the day and most of it was indoor, Swaggy. especially. It, it was all indoor. So a lot of it was indica for that reason. Yeah. Um, indica tends to grow smaller and bushier, which right. you want, that's good when you're indoor. You want to maximize you know, your growth space. And being from the Northeast, um, in, indoor is what you got, you know, yeah, you, for you sure, didn't right. get, wasn't down here in Arizona where you got Mexican swag <laughs> or something like that. It yeah. was, it was all indoor. And so it was usually indoor hydro and which was mostly indica. But anyways, I didn't know anything about any of that stuff at that point. Right. I just knew I packed a bowl, hit it twice and slept like a baby for the first time in a while. Hmm. Um, 
And so... You were like, what? Yeah, that really um, opened the door in many ways and just really led to a lifelong pursuit of, of answers to these questions. You know, why is it portrayed this way in TV? Why is it, you know... Um, demonized by officials and authority figures and so forth and so on and the more I researched the more suspicious I became and the more I researched the more passionate I became about it because it was obvious it was a conspiracy right I used cannabis and for me when I went to college I already knew I used cannabis and it actually um, I mean there were many reasons I probably wouldn't have survived living in a dorm that like, probably wasn't just gonna be for me but the fact that I knew that this was my medicine and like that I used this all day every day um, and I wouldn't be able to do it in that space had already eliminated me from being able to be in that space sure. right and so even now colleges will I mean I have I have met students who've been kicked off campus oh, yeah. because they have cannabis yep. um, if anyone knows the story of Chris Martin here in Arizona uh, really, really sad, you know, two joints uh, at Yavapai College and, you know, he did, it was the beginning of a rough road to say yeah, the least. Yeah. And so um, I know that it's sad that, you know, I think as much as we're normalizing it and as much as we're doing this, we're still not hitting it because that like that kid who got suspended for having weed at school, he can't even have a conversation about it. And it goes on his record to he can't go on to any college. Like yeah. no college will then take him. You, you know, it's, and, and I feel obligated to bring it up, it's, it's deeper than that even. Yeah. Um, there are lots of stories like that and they are terribly unfortunate. But the fact is... The war on drugs has largely been a racial, oh, racially yes. motivated. Yes. Um, yes. You know, there is a such thing of as white privilege, and the only place you need to look for evidence is the war on drugs. Yeah. Correct. The reality of the situation is if I was a different skin color, I may have not had the same story. I may not be right. sitting here. That yeah. That's just the reality of the situation because, yeah, right. as you pointed out, you when you find something that works with little to no side effects or the side effects from largely positive right. um, mm -hmm. you don't really care what everybody else says or yeah. thinks or what that's the right. sets, what some politician yeah. scribbled on a piece of yeah. paper you and you know you don't really care right. if you finally get to sleep exactly you finally I get don't to sleep care. Right. yeah you, I, know? you know so right. and i think that is an absolute correct righteous yeah. mentality but I think yeah. we need to fix it in that space. I think as we're fighting for legalization, that that's an area we don't talk about is in the college space and how the youth that are transitioning who are becoming you know, 18 and young adults who are able to get their medical marijuana card but might yes. be, and they might not even know. I can go get my medical marijuana card and then go to school, live on campus, and not. I didn't know sure. that I couldn't have. What do you mean I can have my medical marijuana? Right. Well, how how can? But I can have my opioids and, and I can have everything else that you would allow me to have on campus. Unfortunately, that's usually what legalization means. I think when most people hear legalization, they think what constitutes decriminalization. Okay, you. Uh, you wipe the slate clean with anybody who's currently in prison. Which we for, should do. Right? Mm -hmm. you, you decriminalize possession, meaning there's, it's no offense. There's yeah. no reason to get pulled over. There's no reason to get fined. There's none of that. I, legalization is a pathway to corporatism of the plant. And I know for a fact that most people who vote for legalization do not want that. Right. But they don't it's understand. It's a catch 22, though. It's, it's a not catch a catch. It, it is a catch 22 if you continue to fall for it, right? Like if you continue to say, well, this is the lesser of two evils. This is the lesser of two evils. This is the. And when we become unprincipled, we end up where we're at right now, which is with shoddy legalization laws right. in various well, states. Well, California where people, is miserable. There are, pe there are still no knock rates for cannabis in yeah. places like Colorado and California and, and Washington where there is explain, adult use. Explain what that term means because I don't. No knock rate. Yeah. Uh, basically stormtroopers dressed all in black SWAT uniforms instead of white. Oh, no, not. Yes, no, yes. not. They just yep. storm your house. Right. Oftentimes shoot your pets, take your stuff. And it's still going on in a state where it's legal. And right. that's because legalization does not mean what I think most people assume it means. Right, right. Yeah. Right. right. When we legalize it, it just basically means that those that are making money off of it are going to make more money off of it, right? Like, let's be honest, that's, at, at the place that we're yeah. in. Right? Legalization loosely translated means oligarchy. I mean, let's hand it over to people that 
are gonna, you know, line pockets. They're gonna. So the word that we should be talking about is decriminalization. Is that the word? That's my humble opinion. Yeah. Is that? I mean, Sarah. I mean, I look at you as someone that I love and trust and look up to. Yeah. Would you? Uh, I think that's agree exactly with that right. I think that's because I think again, as someone, it's is, much bigger. It's, it's much harder bigger as someone decriminalization. It's like it's like should. a no issue. Like it goes away. Yeah. 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 There's... There should be no conversation about yes. legality or not. So yeah. when, if we were to decriminalize it, we wouldn't need all these bills, right? Is that the idea? Anything. You don't need all this right. other stuff, right? You don't. So if we just say we decriminalize it, that's it, all it is. What was it before we criminalized it? Uh -huh. Not a criminal? Decriminalized, right? <laughs> right, I just right. need to I mean, say how the word was it, again. <laughs> how was it treated before, and I say we, it wasn't us, it was... Yeah. Several yeah. generations ago, but before we criminalized it, it was medicine. Was it? Yeah, it's been doctors medicine. used it. Yeah, I mean, Patients yeah, used that's it. actually one hundred percent true yes. up until the marijuana I mean, they stamp have, act. They have bottles where yeah. they know that it was used for sure. Up but. until the marijuana stamp act in nineteen thirty-seven, cannabis tincture oil was the third most prescribed medicine by American physicians. Why is none of this taught? Like, I just don't understand how how there's just they this. Don't whole, want I know that, know. but I, I get that. But now that we know this, how is it still okay that literally? It's left out of history. Like, at some point... Come on, we're still celebrating Columbus Day. Well, again, like, we're, at, <laughs> we're at creating what point, history. Right. We are at, creating history. At what history. point do we really start to rewrite what should be? And I totally agree with you, right? And <laughs> we, and we kids, live in a horrible state where, by the way, happy Columbus MLK Day. Day. Mm -hmm. we, we were the last state, I think, to, to celebrate MLK Day in this wonderful country that we live in. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think we need to look at things and change them all together. But I think, again, who's going to rewrite these history books? Because right now... History is always written by the it's winner. It's not being done. It's oh, not you're being right done. about that. It is. And that's why cannabis isn't in history books. Uh, yeah, we're changing it. We're going to change this. We are going to We are going Well, that's to why we it. have to do what we're doing tonight. Yes. Have and do it as big and as loud and as often as we possibly can. Well, I'm loud and you guys have the info, <laughs> so together this will be great. Uh, all right, so I think we we've been going for about 30, 40 minutes, so we'll we'll take a break. We'll get a little sesh going. I think we've dived pretty deep so far. Is there anything about like the long term history of cannabis that maybe our viewers should know? Um, you know, is there any like one thing that really sticks out in your mind that we didn't You know, we discuss? we we almost touched on it and I thought we were going to and then we We didn't. still have a whole other half I know, though, no, just for but notes. it was early on and there was a perfect time to talk about it and then I just I didn't want to interrupt. But you know, we we were talking about just what this is and, and just educating people properly and I've been at some of these, I've been at a lot of conferences and you know, cause this has exploded pretty quickly and I've gone to quite a bit. Um, I've gone to Mexico, I've gone to London, I've gone to different places for these conferences as well. So I've seen quite a bit and it's amazing to me that even some of the most educated people, some of the pioneers of this industry, some of the people pioneering research, um, still sometimes, well, some of those people are usually pretty good, but sometimes I still hear misinformation or what I would say watered down information. So. Well, you know, yeah. having started on the marijuana side in March of 2012, and then by uh, October of 2014, I had shifted over to, to CBD and hemp. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was I was kind of in the middle of this debate that I didn't understand because I just under, I did a lot of research, so I kind of understood what I was dealing with, and I feel like I was around people who didn't understand. But you know, there was this this, this argument. Well, you know, if I say I'm in the cannabis industry and I deal with hemp, I'm being disingenuous. No. Hemp is cannabis sativa L. Yes. So isn't marijuana, right? Yes. So what is the difference? How do we explain this to people in a fashion that they retain it, they understand it, and they can yeah. explain it to somebody else? And the easiest thing that I can think of, because there's so many crossovers, it's a pretty good analogy, is dogs and dog breeding. Cannabis sativa L is just like saying dog. If I say cannabis, that's like saying dog. I could be talking about a 200-pound bull mastiff, or I could be talking about a two-pound teacup chihuahua, okay? It's really how we selectively breed, which is, again, one of the other analogies that works here, that manifests certain characteristics that make it so different. High in CBD or high in THC or 200 pounds or two pounds or spot black and white spotted or, you know, purple Afghan kush, right? Yes. Like, this is, right, this is what creates this 
diversity is our manipulation of it. And so, you know... And how well we manipulate, by the way. Right. So everything is cannabis, you know, and we talk about, you know, ending this or cannabis prohibition or whatever. And there's even lawyers and politicians and people who sign off on this stuff using the wrong terminology. Another one is psychoactive. Uh, CBD is not psychoactive. It most certainly is psychoactive. It most certainly is psychoactive. You know what else is psychoactive? Sugar. Caffeine. Oh, so these say, are right, all, right. by definition, these are all. Right. What I think say, they how mean is. How does it help is, with my anxiety if it doesn't? Yeah. Like, how are you going to say it, that it doesn't? It, that it's not psychoactive, but you're going to tell me that it helps my anxiety. So it, these are. This is like legalese. It's like a you know a made up term. It, it's most scientifically by the scientific definition of psychoactive it is most certainly psychoactive. But, but then again, so isn't like I said, theory, sugar, everything caffeine. Everything we. Uh, that affects our chemistry. Yes, exactly, yes. exactly. And affects so, our brain chemistry. Exactly, that's and and, and so, um, I think what people probably mean to say is maybe non-euphoric. You know, yeah. Some people say, oh, well, what about psychotropic or non-psychotropic? That pretty much means, um, it's a slightly Similar. refined definition of yeah. psychoactive. It basically means the same thing. But, anyways, I, I wanted to make sure we pointed that out. Okay. Cannabis is like saying dog. Marijuana is like saying one breed and hemp is like saying another breed, but they are identical genetically. They can breed with each other, which is how we get so many different combinations. And then we can breed with their offspring, which is really how we get into strains and cultivars. Uh, but that's how we, we got here. And it's just, I feel it's important that people know the words they're using. Yeah, no, I agree. And language means a lot when, when we're trying, especially when we're trying to learn, I think. For sure. And then if you use the governmental definition hemp would be with a low percentage of thc point zero zero that's really what when people talk about hemp and marijuana mm -hmm. it really is a legal definition just so yeah, that they're yes. the, yeah. the, the difference in the plant i could show you hemp plant grown yeah. outdoors you would have no idea that that's not marijuana. Not marijuana. Right. Well, that's even... It, it I mean, looks even exactly right. the same. And so I don't mean smells, like... Right, a hemp same, bud. Same, same right. leaves. Right. I, you know... Oh, a good hemp bud. Leaves. I mean, it looks right. exactly... Right, you put a good without, hemp bud in front of someone in front of a, and a good marijuana bud next to each other, you yeah. won't know the difference. Right. I so, completely so, agree with you. I've been very surprised. So hemp and marijuana are legal definitions yes. that can only be defined with quantitative analysis chemically. That's right. that's what they are. There, there isn't really a difference otherwise. That's why a lot of people, a lot of law, law enforcement and authorities are freaking out right now <laughs> right. because hemp is legal. Right. And, That's right. Um, the uh, hemp flower looks, smells, yes. uh, just like. Yeah. I mean, uh, anyway. Wait, so what if they pull you over? So, so this is where I'm going with this. If I ever get pulled over, I was, I, I'm telling this you now, I already know, I was, I would only ever medicate off CBD anywhere where I could get in trouble the, this, ever. That's where I was going with all this, is what are the implications <laughs> yes, legally for yes. people who use cannabis, whichever right. form. And, and we don't know that either. Well, we can speculate. Do we? Until this court precedence, we don't know, yeah. but we can speculate, and that's kind of fun sometimes. Is but, it? So no no human or no dog can smell the difference between the two the two with the you know the terpene profiles again two identical dogs are great but they're not that great so the only way to know is field tests which are notoriously poor and they're colorimetric typically which means you need to rely on make sure that that person is not colorblind um, so there are various issues with that but the point where I was going all like that uh, with this is I've heard some attorneys theorize that the smell of cannabis can no longer be used as a, a justification for a violation of the Fourth Amendment, which is search and seizure of your property, your vehicle, or what have you, or your person. Mm -hmm. So because hemp is legal, right. and no one right. dog or person could ever distinguish the difference by odor alone, right. the smell of cannabis may no longer be admissible. legal justification, admissible in court. Has I don't know if it's happened yet. It's ine it's inevitable that it will. Yeah, but I think though at the same time, at, like and let's just be honest. Again, going back to the beginning of this conversation of kind of where and who gets impacted by all this. If you're in a neighborhood with a police officer that wants to mess with you because your car smells like cannabis, they're mm -hmm. going to. And if you're in a neighborhood where you have a police oh, yeah. officer who maybe doesn't give a shit, then you've lucked out.
Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the people most often I've, who are going to get screwed by this are going to be the people who don't have the money to pay for the attorneys, right. who can't fight it. You know, who, really... Who, who doesn't have anything to theorize for them. If though. the people that make and enforce the rules played by their own rules, as soon as we had medical in state, the smell of cannabis should have been... Yeah. Um, if that... Because... But if, if they played by their own rules, we this would be a very different I know, world. I, but I do want to... I, I agree with you 100%. Yes. And I just feel, yes. you know, want to point it out. But yes. And the reason for that is because you could be a patient and you yeah. have right to patient yes. privacy of yes. what medications you're on. You absolutely mm-hmm. have that right. And that patients should know their rights. Of their HIPAA laws. Yes. So, you know, if it if they really... If it was really about, you know, what they say, it's about, you know, protecting oh, people course. and, you know, yeah. keeping well, it mean, out of criminals' again, hands if, if and all this what stuff. police were really... Exactly. Know, yeah. Well, All right, we're on that note. <laughs> Did you have something to say before we go to break? We yeah, break. we can talk about it afterwards. Okay. I was going to say it's never going to be possible to do a field sobriety test in cannabis. We yes. We can talk about it after break. But they yeah. can, and I know people who have gotten DUIs because they say that you're... Uh, yeah, no, no, yeah, what I'm saying yeah, is that there's no one. way right. that they, they will ever be blood, able to accurately... And then you're... And then you're yeah. All right. Yeah. After break. All right, everyone, we're coming back in a few. Go get your session, and we'll see you.